Here we go. Uh, well, uh, welcome to another uh, segment of this uh, program, uh, Poets in Montana. I'm Mark Gibbons, and uh, today I'm talking with uh, uh, an, an old friend and, and one of the poets who's been here forever, it seems like to me, uh, Greg Keeler. Greg has, uh, has done almost everything that I can think of. He's one of those sort of Renaissance artsy people that does everything and does it <laughs> incredibly well. Uh, but poetry is, uh, uh, is, is the way that I sort of found out about him. And, uh, and he's going to share some of his work with us today. So uh, without further ado, welcome, Greg. Good to see you, man. Thanks, Mark. Good to be here. Yeah. Actually, I, it's good to be here, although I'm just sitting in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I noticed when I first we first turned this thing on. Uh, that's a painting of yours right behind you, isn't it? It is. I I put them all around my living room. I'm sort of like a stone fly or something that puts up its own little thing around itself to pretend it has a an interesting life. <laughs> You've got a gallery there. Right, that's right. <laughs> I, I'm, actually, I, I think I'm thinking of caddis flies. They're the ones that put little things all around themselves <laughs> so that they may someday emerge. All right, yeah. See, I mean, I I, I can learn a lot. I, I picked up uh, last night, I, I, I was just kind of looking back at some of the you know your publications, the the collections of poetry, the ones I have anyway. And I I, I took a look at the American Falls uh, uh, book, and uh, that's just a lesson in fishing right there, and uh, etymology and <laughs> all that business. Well, that's back when I con had convinced myself that fishing was a religion. Yeah, yeah. But, but but anymore. I, I wouldn't want to be smirch fishing with that title. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I, for, for my own uh, selfish uh, interest, I'll, I'll say that uh, I, I first discovered you uh, as a teacher. Well, I mean, I, I, I knew who you were as a poet, uh, and I knew that you were over in Bozeman at Montana State University uh, teaching, and you were the guy over there, but I first uh, encountered your your work in another uh, venue or, 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 or fashion when I took a, a classroom of kids up to Shoto for a play that... Uh, that was, it must have been 87. Was it like something to do with the centennial or what? Yeah, it was called Rewinding Montana. Yeah, it was, yeah, 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 Rewinding Montana. It was, it was sort of the, as everything I've done in that medium, uh, it was a spoof, just sort of poking fun at all the myths. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was fun. I, I used to work with the vigilante players and they did maybe five of things that we did together with help from other people too. But And they were the guys that, that uh, the ones, the people that put it on down in Virginia City, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, and they they went around the state performing it like they're the ones you saw up and showed or, or maybe they're the ones you saw up and showed to I, I think to like Tom uh was it Tom uh Q Morris. Thomas Q Morris yeah yeah he played uh uh Lewis I think yeah. <laughs> among other things <laughs> it was I was just a hoot and it was just a you know I mean uh well, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that I, I guess you do, I think that's so interesting and everybody else I think thinks is pretty interesting is that you, you are, you do give a voice to uh, not only to uh, these people who are not, not uh, in, in the uh, elevated sort of levels of society, the us down here in the backwaters, 
you give those people voices and, uh, and, and, and you give humor an opportunity. Well, thanks. I'm glad you see it that way. You know, it's like, uh, I just was visiting with my friend, Robert Lee, who, who, uh, yeah. who also <laughs> enjoys humor, but, but when he was, we were, we were talking and, and uh, somebody uh, called him, uh, accused him of writing humorous poems. And he said, well, you know, I mean, uh, it's, that's satire is a, is a great way to deal with pain. <laughs> there you go. That's pretty much the sum of it. Robert had it down. Oh, God. So I, 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 I was thankful uh, that you sent me those, those, uh, those pieces that you, you've done recently in conjunction with that with that uh, site where people interact like ecrastics kind of poetry or whatever? Yeah, it's called, it's called pseudo write, and I don't know how to use it, but I, I send a friend my poems, my daily efforts, and, and he uh, go, go I, I guess pseudo is on Google, and he goes there and uh, feeds them into it, and it comes out both with paintings and written responses to them, and he sends me both. And I'm, I'm always kind of puzzled. I have no idea how that works, you know, how it takes the language. It seems to interpret the emotion somehow from the language, and uh, the, the last one I got was pretty grotesque. I, <laughs> I had to look at the poem again to see where... <laughs> See where Pseudo got that. Was that the Why We're Here poem? Uh, no, or, or yeah, yeah, I think it might be. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about there. It was a, quite a pudding of uh, activity or, or whatever was going on there. <laughs> right, right. It, it's, it sort of looks like heaped corpses with one, with one of them sticking out in the middle with its ribs showing or something. It, I mean, that's my interpretation of pseudo. I, yeah. But I don't see, I don't quite see how that happened, but I, I, I really like to see the responses. I think anybody can do that. Probably most people are more tech savvy than I can and could go right to Google and go to pseudo and feed their poems in and see what kind of pictures it comes up with. Yeah, yeah. It'll, I mean, and so uh, it's, uh, are there people that are doing that? I don't think so. <laughs> well, pe people have fed all kinds of imagery and styles and things like that. I'm guessing. Okay. And, okay. And, and then it just uh, grabs what it can accord according to the language and what it thinks your emotion is judging from the language and stuff so, but i i don't i don't know nobody actually reads the poem it just goes through pseudo <laughs> that's why it's called pseudo <laughs> so it, so it's the uh, it's the future of mankind i guess so <laughs> well I, I look at the poems it writes in response to my poems and sometimes they're better but <laughs> but some sometimes they're uh, just sort of obvious takeoffs on what I'm saying. So that's not so much fun. But when it, when I think, gee, I wish I'd written that, I think, hey, I'm expendable. <laughs> I'm obsolete. <laughs> obsolete. Uh, reminds me of an old Twilight episode, Twilight Zone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, uh, well, uh, why don't you, I mean, before we uh, uh, get too far in, into just uh, BS and uh, why don't you read us a poem or two? Okay, I'll, I'll find that one. We just talked about, if I can, why, why we're here. I'll hold it up so it sort of looks like I'm actually reading to you. <laughs> uh, why we're here. We're here to document the stars as their light washes over us, to measure the sand grain by grain. We're here to watch the flowers open and close and open and close then die. We're here to gauge the sound of a tab top being popped, the feel of a fossil being wrestled from the rocks. 
We're here to emulate the busy lives of ducks to make sense of their muted quacking. We're here to make tools of straightened paper clips to blow on embers and make them hotter. We're here to bellow vast pronouncements about why we're here. <laughs> Uh, the, the, and here's another one, then we'll continue our chat here. But what you know, they tell you to write about what you know. Are they crazy? I would wind up writing about picking my nose or brushing my teeth, though teeth require an expertise I might not have, so I probably shouldn't write about it. I'm pretty sure I don't know myself, so that's out of the question. How about my profession? I've never known what it is, much less how to do it. Even the backs of my hands keep changing. God forbid I should write about others. I mean, who are they anyway? I might write about sex or fishing, but just because I like to do them doesn't mean I know how. <laughs> That's wonderful, man. I just think that's great. Yeah. Well, I, I get up every morning and do one of those uh, uh, for better or worse. And was that second one uh, uh, a sonnet length? Yeah, they're all sonnet length. Right. As you know, I, I used to pay attention, close attention to the form, usually of a Shakespearean sonnet form. Right. But uh, after the first few hundred of those, I, I thought <laughs> this is, I, I've pretty much run that one dry. I'll, I'll just put 14 lines and, and maybe five beats a line. Yeah. Uh, and maybe even iambic, but usually I just, uh, I mean, I've, I've been trying to rationalize what I do so it will sound you know, professional or whatever, but like Hopkins, Gerard Manley Hopkins talked about inscape and in stress and all that. Right. And all he was doing is saying, you can use three accented syllables in a row if you want to. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thought, so that's what that means. So I, I go back and some of my lines are real short because they got, you know, it's like, uh, in, remember the old Superman uh, narrative on the, the old TV show that said, able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Yeah. <laughs> that stuck in my head forever. I mean, I went in there when I was six or seven, you know, and that da 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 some of my poems just, uh, if a person is looking for an iambic pentameter, they're going to have a tough time of it. And anymore, I'll use rhymes, but generally, not always, but generally, I'll put them inside of the lines so they aren't so obvious. Right. But then yeah, I won't. But, but I did know, I do notice, I mean, even in the stuff that you're doing now or, or how this this sonnet form that you still you still cling to a 14 line sort of a poem but 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 how that's evolved and shifted it's uh the rhythms are just so wonderful they're just the you know it's like the the, the like the the rhythms of natural speech the you know William Carlos Williams type of rhythm uh but I mean it's uh it, to me it's it, it just it sings it's very very musical but it's not what you would expect from the sonnet form, which, like you say, you were seriously doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I stuck to the form, uh, and, and it dragged me around by the balls, basically. But I, I stuck with it for quite a while, and uh, it, it would lead me into cliches and stuff. But I let it do that, you know. It, it, Hell, I mean, you, your batting average was great. I mean, I mean, they were, they were, they were. You were putting them out of the park. I thought one after another, and then, and then there would be the next one, and I'd go, "Oh, that one, yeah, that one, that one's right, 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 right." 
whilst I hear thy merry cheer up no more. <laughs> so, you know, that, that kind of sonnet language. Yeah, exactly. That stilted form. Right, right. Well, I, I remember you, uh, I, when I asked you about that, I think years ago, uh, when you started writing sonnets, you, you, you said that, well, you decided to do that as an exercise because you thought you ran out of things to say. Right. And it was sort of like a mental can opener. Yeah. It, it forced me places that I wouldn't have gone otherwise. Right. Uh, a, a rhyme will drag you out of your intentions and change directions whether you want to or not. Exactly. Uh, but uh, free verse is another thing. Uh, was it Frost that said writing free verse is like playing tennis without a net? <laughs> and and I, I'm more of in the line of playing ping pong without a net. <laughs> there's, a, there's a, it's a lot more intimate and more noise involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I, why don't you uh, give us something else? Read us, read us something else. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you at some point, maybe, do you have your books with you also? Uh, uh, can, it's can, not it's not it's not essential but i mean i i'll i'll, I'll ask you later if you if you want to read yeah, there's one just a few steps away that i can all right i'll get i'll grab it and read some of the more formal stuff in just a second Uh, there, the Bluebird Run. Bluebird Run, yeah. What a great book. Well, this one makes fun of uh, Shakespeare's Sonnet 116, Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds. And it's still in the form with the rhymes and stuff, but at least it tries to get out of it by using the vernacular. Okay. Sonnet 116 revisited. There is no stopping the marriage of true minds. My love wouldn't change you for the world, though the world may change. No one finds love in a moving target. A flag unfurled in a tempest, it holds steady and shows the heart's true colors. Love's not time's bitch, though what time does to our bodies blows. To love ours, to love, hours and weeks are a real stitch. In truth, love will stick it out until we croak. I'm just saying Shakespeare had it right, though he was just an old style British bloke. And what you've read so far is Shakespeare light. If this is wrong, that limey should have quit. Pigs have wings and I can't write for shit. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, four lines in, we were we were so into that. We were right in a Shakespearean world, and then, and then the, I don't remember what the first word was. It wasn't blows? It was the one before that. Bitch. Yeah, That's right. Bitch took us out of that moment, and then we just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of like my whole poetic career. I started out trying to do it right, and then thought. Screw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's where it's at. But th there, are, there are more formal ones, I, I guess, like like uh, the title poem, "The Bluebird Run," which has Retke and Hugo. I, I was reading them for a lot before I started writing these. The Bluebird Run, call us silly, flawed, and left behind. Call us followers of trickles gleaming in the wind. Too fickle for a made-up mind, too stubborn for a life devoid of dreaming. 
we've noticed that the golden willows all blow one way. So that's the way we're going. And we're going on the bluebird run to Wilsow. And if the road should run beyond our knowing, tell the magpies, tell the hawks, the wind is in our favor. We're looking for that flash of blue to make us new and to rescind the winter for a while. If we seem rash or foolish, then assume a smile tells all and we're heading on the bluebird run to Wilsall. Yeah. Someone from Wilsall said, that's Will Sal. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I, poetic license. <laughs> well, I, somebody, uh, uh, I, I, I get a, a thing in my email, I guess Patty Smith maybe, and she read uh, 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 Blake's The Tiger again, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, whose hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry. <laughs> right, right, right. But the try yeah. is what we want. <laughs> yeah, and I, I always, I, I fooled myself into thinking that they used to say symmetry. Without <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, that, uh, I, th 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 that's a phenomenal book that, and that, you know, it, it obviously, the, the poems in that book, how, how long uh, do you think, I mean, there's so damn many of those sonnets in that book. There's, how many of them are there? Uh, uh, Chuck, a couple hundred? No. Let me look. Yeah, it's, it's a. I meant for there to be a, a, a couple hundred, but I think there turned out to be like uh 190 or so. Right, right. Yeah. How many years, roughly, do you think? Well, I, I guess it was a couple years. I I, uh, I write one every day and right. did back then, too, when I was writing in form. So I had, I probably had a 600 or so to choose from. Right. That's because that's a couple of years of a little less than a couple of years of what I what I write. Yeah. Some of them just when I read back over it, I shudder. Uh, it, but some of them, I, I are kind of fun. So it's oh, not. I, I, it's a, it's, a, it's an absolutely amazing collection, and and that makes sense uh, that that you would have uh, been able to. Uh, uh, choose from that many and, and in that short a time period i mean i've had people tell me at times they said oh i you're you're fairly prolific and i'm like are you kidding me i'm not even close to prolific with compared to a whole lot of people i know that that uh, that, that write like you do well but there there's a difference uh you're prolific prolific as far as good poetry goes <laughs> <laughs> and, as, as, as is my other poet friend or another poet friend Earl Craig he's uh, he's pretty pro prolific too but he says well I certainly don't write as many as you do and I say yeah but every one of yours hits the spot you know as as do yours so well I mean I, I uh, your poetry entertains in ways that, uh, and, it, and it's not just, you know, I mean, I, what it does is besides it entertains, it, it's also just so totally human. I mean, because humor is, is so much a part of who we are and, and to deny that, I mean, but to an extent, I remember I was in, uh, when I, I went back, you know, as an old man to go to graduate school, I thought I was an old man. I was in my early forties and, uh, and one of the poets that came to teach and a guy that I kind of, you know, got close to was the poet Jack Gilbert. And mm -hmm. Jack Gilbert was, you know, very, uh, he was very romantic and very serious, uh, you know, as a poet, he was a good poet, but, uh, he, you know, he believed that there really was no room for humor in poetry. You know, he was a bad old school. Well, Humorous poetry wouldn't be humorous if there weren't attitudes like that. Yeah. That you know, I I don't call it a bad attitude at all. It's an important attitude. Right. 
like sometimes when I used to do more readings with other people, I'd go out and and they'd read their hard work, serious stuff, and, and then I'd get up and read some wacky thing and get a big response, you know. And, and it, it's it's sort of like going to a poetry reading and singing songs or something. It's sort of like that's not fair. You shouldn't use humor. I remember once Robert Bly actually told me uh, in the one or two times I talked to him. It, he said in his little Robert Bly voice, we must not be funny. <laughs> that, that was one of the funniest things I'd ever heard coming out of him in that way. <laughs> oh, God, yes, we must not be funny. <laughs> we must take ourselves seriously or or I don't know, I mean, uh, 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 or, or take poetry seriously or whatever I, I yeah and as and as you say with with what robert lee said uh, some sometimes you have to use humor to get at the painful stuff exactly you, you don't have to but some some of us would prefer to do it that way and it might be cheating but so well, what? it it i think it's 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 honest yeah, maybe. Although humor is, by definition, sort of dishonest. <laughs> well, I'm saying that that dishonesty, that expression of our dishonesty with through humor, is honest. In right. the I see what you mean. So it's right. in that regard, it's it's completely honest to show that this is what human beings do. Yeah, we, we can't hand you. We can't handle the truth. <laughs> that's right. We have to make a fucking joke about it. You know. Yeah, it's sort of like you're saying one thing but meaning another. Yeah. That's not poetry. <laughs> sort of like, but but I I thought that's what it was. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, uh, is there something else at hand that you you want to sure. share? Sure. Uh, this is called B proof. You have made an honest attempt to control your own narrative, but at every turn it starts controlling you. You don't understand the one that tells you to stick it out even if it kills you, or worse, you kill someone else. Still, you define yourself as the one who takes the honey from the bees, though the bees don't agree with you, they never do. If they're capable of want, they want to define you as the one who got stung and gave up, not the one who put them in boxes, wore a bee-proof suit, and took their honey on a regular basis. Is that even a narrative? <laughs> That's another thing that you, your poems do a lot. Uh, that that I mean that I, I that I've noticed when I was going back over your collections here again too is that they take the they take on the personas of of uh, of animals and other people and and I think that's a that's always a fun thing to uh, to explore and of course I think humor pops in a lot of times too and sometimes just my irritation with the language itself, like in this one, now on the news shows, they're always talking about controlling the narrative, you know? Right. And in, uh, instead of uh, telling your story or instead of talking, they say having a conversation. Yeah. We, well, we'll have that conversation. We had a conversation, having a conversation. Yeah. And, and as they're doing that, they have to use, say the word often with a T in it. They have to say often or people, people won't think that they're well read. Yeah. But saying, I saw it on the page as often, so I'm gonna say it that way. Uh, exactly. That's, that's sort of my Andy Rooney approach to language of why do they always have to, you know, sort of that whining thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <coughs> I, uh, 
I, I, I found a couple, and and, and, uh, and your second uh, or the other book that I have uh, besides American Falls and the Bluebird Run is is uh, uh, Epiphany at Goofy's Gas. Yeah. And uh, as I was peeking through that, uh, you know, I uh, it, it, along the same lines, I guess, of the personification or the point of view of a bee or the title of this one is Turkey. Do you remember that poem? I do, I do. Yeah, I, it was sort of like since Ben Franklin wanted the turkey to be the national bird and uh, I thought, why not? Uh, after all, bald eagles are pretty much buzzards <laughs> or, or at least you know, preying on carrion and stuff. And, but uh, then again, turkey seems more apropos to what we've turned into. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, uh, Although that's an insult to turkeys, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the uh, you don't have this handy, probably. Uh, I don't think so. Let me check. You want me to read it to you? Sure, sure. Turkey. If Ben Franklin had had his way. I'd be your national bird. Screw your bald eagle. Just another pretty vulture. Didn't I feed your founding fathers? Didn't the old boys grab their blunderbusses and bring me home instead of the bacon? They're there at first when the going was tough. And their old ladies, didn't they wrestle me in the kitchen, scald me, pluck me, then slit me gizzard to crop? I never did have much luck with the ladies. Just ask my wife who swears she's not a hen or a wife either for that matter. Perhaps I didn't spend enough time in the bushes. Perhaps my head looks too much like a penis and I'm too fat and I can't get rid of this drawl no matter how far north fish and game tries to introduce me. <laughs> Hey, you read that great. I'll have to get you to come around and read my poems for me. <laughs> I mean, these are these are pretty entertaining to read, right? It's a well, they are very dramatic. Yeah, well, you you've caught that one really well. <laughs> and on the face page, homage to Louis L'Amour uh, makes me think of all the all the young kids in small towns in Montana that uh, every, when I was teaching English that, uh, you know, I had tried to create a paperback library in the classroom and whatnot, but uh, most of the books that were checked out by boys were the Louis L'Amours. <laughs> they oh, of loved those things, man. They just ate them up one right yeah. after another. Yeah, that, that, that old dime novel things in the American grain. And actually, uh, uh, if you if you uh, if you can if we can indulge me to read one more of these, I'll read this thing. I'd be happy for you to because uh, <clears throat> uh, interestingly enough, it <clears throat> pardon me, it, it makes me think of uh, what we were just sort of referring to in terms of what the hell is going on in our America right now. Yeah. Homage to Louis L'Amour. <clears throat> that hunk who rode off into the sunset and said he was never coming back, but he always did. You know, the one who wore a white hat at first, but, was, but, but then started wearing a black hat. The one who had a big pig of a colt sticking out in front of him <clears throat> when things got a little vague well he's not coming back first the hat got so dark you couldn't even see it then the colt started to jam then the hunk and his horse got into aerobatics aerobics jazzercise to be exact they started to feel good about themselves 
when the cattlemen and sheepmen shot it out at the edge of town, he served as a go-between, telling first one side, then the other, I like what you're saying, or I'm hearing you, would you go with that? Tell the calf, lay down with the lamb. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what happened, all right. It's sort of like sidling up to the bar and say, give me one of them lattes. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody gets along in the end. By golly. Yeah, that's that's a fantasy, isn't it? There's an American myth for you, right? There. That's a true myth, right? Yeah, it's uh, and that's you know, I mean, I I uh, I don't know about you, but I I I I was informed at a very early age of uh, of what the reality of America was all about because my father was very tuned into it, right? And so he, he just, he, he passed that information on. So I was kind of tuned into the fact that we were, we were built on a bunch of lies and, that, uh, and genocide and, and all the rest that, that, that we've done in our, in our history. Uh, the whole time, you know, uh, waving the flag and talking about what the best, we were the best and the greatest and whatnot. Right. But but what was but what seemed to be what everybody kind of seemed to hold on to and what seemed to be the most important aspect of it and, and maybe what we actually needed to just keep going was this was this idea that there was hope, that this was a place of hope, that our rhetoric did present the opportunity for people to really try to live together and tolerate each other. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It, it, and and it is, it is the rhetoric because I I don't think any side is afraid in this country is afraid to espouse the rhetoric, but uh, uh, yeah, it's it's true. How do you you can't really go with that language without having to make tremendous justifications or saying, oh, they didn't mean that or something. You know? At every turn, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it's, uh, and so, so it is, uh, it, it's, it's mythology that has both sort of obviously negative and, and, and positive sort of energy to it, you know? I mean, it, it, I don't know. Uh, it, it is. It is uh, between the between the damn pandemic and 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 the and the sort of the uh, the devolution of of this whole democratic uh, society over the last decade or so. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a strange place to be in. I guess that and just getting older, maybe maybe that's part of it too. No, no, I I used to listen to my older friend say it's not like what it's not you know it's not like it used to be and everything back then was in present a rosy picture and stuff so i can fall back on that and think well maybe this is just how people get but it, it seems like things really have gotten bad <laughs> you know and, and it's not just my brain cells getting old it's that too maybe the combination like you say sort of cast it in a even darker gloom as far as hope goes but right it seems like younger people still have a vision of something that could go right you know i'm, that, I'm hoping that's 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 the hope that's the i guess that's the real hope for me <clears throat> is that uh the next generation <clears throat> will uh sort of help help things evolve further and, and you know and that's the every time uh, uh, I start thinking about you know uh, just what's happened during uh, my lifetime it's like well yeah things things have changed obviously things are things are way better for a, a whole lot of people than they were 50 60 years ago and then you think about 
I think about my parents' generation and, and, uh, and I read stories and, and things back then or a generation before that. And George or H, uh, what was uh, uh, George W's daddy, H, uh, H.G.? Or uh, whatever. George H.W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the senior Bush said. Oh, 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 yeah, the one that was with the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> well, his his son said that we we were we were, we were becoming kinder, kinder and gentler. Right, right. And yeah, you know, I, I to an extent, we we definitely are. I think you know, even though we keep stepping back, we keep swinging back into these throwback uh, moments of latching on to uh, you know real sort of brutal, violent sort of imagery and intent. I know. I, I I guess there's a book out. I haven't read it about how uh, the new Christian man is a, a very manly, take control, no nonsense, smack them around if they get out of line kind of man. And they like, they like it. You know, the people who get smacked around, it's sort of yeah. what America should be. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, that's nothing new that's been around a while, but, you know, I, that's sort of what that uh, Louis L'Amour homage poem was about, is, is wearing the black hat and having a pig of a colt sticking out in front of you, and then things start to get a little more complicated, and well, the, uh, the colt doesn't work too well, and Right. But no, I'm going to stick with it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I, you, we, we try, to, I, I try to figure out, you know, the whys and wherefores, not that I ever will, but uh, it obviously has to do with power and, and uh, it, it has to do with uh, money and, uh, to an extent. I just don't understand what, what they figure is to be gained by any of this kind of sort of reptilian <laughs> no it is it is it's really reptilian yeah I don't I don't, I don't think there's so much to, I don't I don't even think the people who practice it think there's much to be gained from it it's just it's just their amygdala amygdala blowing up it's, it's just their aggressive their, their vagus nerve snapping and and what do they call they call it being triggered now and it's it's like people are getting triggered all over the place. It's yeah. It's like all, all you have to say is a few words to some people, and they'll start snapping. You know, right. right. And it, it's scary because I don't I I don't like to watch my language that much, you know. And right. But because partially. Because of the pandemic and partially because I've been retired for 10 years, I don't get out that much. So I don't uh, have to get in those one on ones. When I used to go out, I'd sing my satirical songs to all sorts of groups like Democrats, Republicans, Country Club, uh, Earth First rallies, you name it. I'd, I'd go play at it. Yeah. And there was always somebody there. To, argue with or get pissed off but they they'd like like the conservative people like my voice and the way i said things and stuff and or sang them or whatever and right uh, and anymore i i don't i i know even when i stopped playing quite a few years back i it had started to taper off and people would just turn and ignore me you know when i was playing for a group of people right and, never happened before yeah maybe and like we say maybe it was me and I was getting old and wasn't as interesting as I was when I was younger or maybe the audiences themselves had changed I think it might have been a little bo of both right right but there definitely is a there's just sort of a prevailing uh uh, uh, you know, and, and for want of a better term, uh, lack of, I guess, courtesy, just sort of civility that, that we sort of used to go along with, even if we totally disagreed with whoever was standing in front of us, 
we didn't, you know, call them out as a stupid fucking idiot to their face, you know. Right, right. They just let them, let them have their own world and go that way. But now, and a lot of that has to do with this social media thing. It's just people are, they've, uh, they've gotten practiced at doing it because it's easy to snipe. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's just, I mean... Uh, Trolling is trying to trigger people. You know, when you troll, you're trying to trigger people. Right. And why would we do that? You know, why would we want to trigger people and get get them to snap and be mad? And but it it uh, sells advertising on Facebook apparently, and so uh, that's yeah. People, I I, th I think a certain number of people have gotten bored uh, with their lives and and one way out of it is is this online stuff right where, uh, they're not bored if, if you're being triggered and you're getting furious and snapping then you're not bored it's like something's happening so may, maybe that's it it's yeah I mean that's and, and a lot of it too. I guess you know maybe you know just being uh, over the last uh, couple of years that we've been certainly stuck more at home th than we have been uh, uh, previously, and uh, and and so that is kind of a, a, like Facebook friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. We, 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 this is a friend. Oh, <laughs> right, my friend. Right. You Look know? at all the friends I have. It's kind of like it's kind of like those artists who are drawing to your poems on pseudo right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. One reason I like to send my stuff or like my friend to send it in and show me what comes out is I think, oh damn, I'm deeper than I thought. <laughs> <You know? laughs> of course, it, how many how many minds and thought processes did it take to create that artistic oh God, thing know. that would do that drawing for you out of all these different art, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I, the logarithm for that baby. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, probably just people feeding more stuff into other things. They feed enough stuff into something, it'll start thinking for itself in its own special little way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, that's and that's of course the science fiction story we're all thinking about or have been for a long time. Right. I, I remember in high school when we read uh, <clears throat> 1984 and and Brave New World uh, and that's those kinds of books. I thought, man, that was like that was like space age stuff. That was so yeah. far <laughs> into the distance that you know. I, here we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, time is such a strange phenomenon. It is, it is. Especially when we get stuck in it. Yeah. Well, or when it outpaces us or whatever. Uh, I, I don't have poems about it with me at the moment, but a lot of my poems over the past 10 years have dealt with my time contracting, you know, where years are more like months and I'll, I'll right. be reading or doing something and then without looking up, I'll have, before I look out the window, I have to tell myself, is it winter or summer? Right. You know, something like that. <laughs> and, and I think, I really think that this, this last two years has even complicated that further because oh, yeah. we, we've been so far out of a, any kind of a timeline, any kind of a weekly or whatever, at least I have been. And of course, yeah. I know you've been retired a long time and on your own schedule, but, but still, did you notice that too, that, that, that the last two years has maybe even oh, yeah. Yeah. Potentially, yeah. yeah done something to that way of thinking? Yeah. Be because it's, it's, forced us even into even more strict routines it mm -hmm. seems like and the more strict the routine the the less changes there are to remember what happened by you know right so like two two days seems like it could be two weeks and and mm -hmm. and and six months seems like it could have been 
a week ago, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, you have to stop and think or look at a calendar or something to figure out where you are. Exactly. Uh, oh my God, Greg, I can't, I can't believe it. We're getting close. We're getting close to an hour. Uh, uh, and it, this this same thing happened uh, uh, in in live and in person, which maybe even made it go faster with uh, 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 the uh, David Cates the other day. And it was just a it was just a great visit. And I, uh, I I think he only read two poems <laughs> in the time that we did this. You know, it was fun to talk. I, we're lonely these days. I think we need company. Exactly. And uh, well, well, you know, why don't you read us something else uh, kind of before we wrap this thing up and. Uh, belief. I came much closer to believing in the tooth fairy than I did in Santa or God. Santa just brought presents and was a ploy of my conniving parents. God was pretty much the same, except he never brought presents. I leaned toward Jesus and the Easter bunny like I leaned toward lamb and chocolate. But in the end, the tooth fairy won out. I had put this odd currency from inside of my mouth under my pillow, and in the morning it had been replaced by a cold, hard dime. Sometimes I would put the dime in my mouth. I, I was wondering how to end that. And then I thought, well, that's what I did sometimes. And somehow, somehow it made some sort of metaphysical sense. <laughs> the dishonest truth of it all. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, this has been an absolute pleasure, man. And, and uh, as I... I also said to uh, to to uh, the last couple of people I just did this with in the last week, uh, Roger and David, uh, we, we could do about, you know, maybe 30 of these pretty easy. <laughs> Not that anybody would want to watch 30. <laughs> right, <that's right. laughs> but, but maybe we can do this again. Uh, if I if I go through the list and we're both still alive, you know, yeah. <laughs> trying to create this big archive of of poets. But uh Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure. So let me uh, let me say farewell to uh, Greg Keeler and thank you so much for sharing your poems with thank us you, today. Mark. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you are a, you are a gem, man. A Montana original, even though you're not originally from Montana. No, no I'm an Okie. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you. Well, glad to be here. All right. Well, we're we're signing off for today and join us again next week. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who you'll see, but it'll be somebody of interest. I can guarantee you that. So long. Yeah.